Gregory Keane is here to resume with another chapter of the story. Nick Barnes has left for Singapore and Hong Kong, and we're up against a dead end with the murder of Evelyn Channel. Both Huberman and Barnes have alibis for last night that you couldn't break a hole in with a pneumatic drill. So we're relying for the moment on Tom Cutts. As you know, Cutts has broken the ice at Gregerson Street, and earlier today, Inspector Murray pushed the good work along by showing Huberman a fictitious file from London on a hoodlum called Fenner. We want Cutts inside the nightshade ring, and we want him in desperately. One of the few scraps of significant information we were able to get out of Barnes was this. Five days from now, the ring are bringing a shipment of narcotics into the country. In these five days, we have to learn how and when. I'm telling you all this from Sherry Reed's apartment. I came back here from Phillips Street this morning to catch up on some sleep. One's hours are inclined to be odd. Sherry has just turned on breakfast at 4.30 in the afternoon. More coffee, Keen. No, thanks. But I would like a fag. Oh, good girl. How many days have you been cooped up here? Four. Seems like a month since that shooting up in the Hawkesbury. But it's only four days and four nights. Are you getting fed up with it? Any time I am, I just remember those three minutes in the speedboat, a chill runs up and down my spine bone, and I get right back on the lounge and like it. Mm. But you are feeling the strain, aren't you, Sherry? Oh, who wouldn't? I have to keep reminding myself not to show any lights at night. I can only answer the phone if it rings twice and then rings again. And every time my front door goes, I jump about two feet in the air. Well, it won't be forever. Keen, how long will it be? Till the nightshade ring get overconfident and step out of line. But you've only cut some this dope smuggling to go on. You're practically up against the stone wall. You don't just want to bust the ring. You want something you can hang Huberman and Carlotta Magnani for, and you could try for years and never get it. We'll get it, but it won't take years. When I look out over the city from my terrace, it looks the same. A million and a half people doing what people in cities always do. Policemen on point duty and masses of traffic. Men digging great holes in the streets and double-deckers dodging in and out. Everything seems so safe and so normal. Just below the surface, there's this awful thing going on like a cancer. While the two people who run it sit and are photographed dancing at the embassy and get two columns on the social page just to show they didn't actually strangle Evelyn Channel. Shirley, darling, I wish you'd do as I say. Oh, not again, Keith. Yes, again. While you stay in Sydney, you're walking the edge of a precipice. But I wish you'd hop on a plane and get a thousand miles away. No. But it's the right time of the year. Now, why don't you go up to one of those barrier reef islands and get yourself some sun? You could use an assumed name. For the 50th time, I'm not going to leave here. But for the life of me, I can't see the point of your staying. That's because you're as blind as a marsupial mole. You say I'm walking a precipice. All right, what about you? Do you think I could lie about in the sun hanging on every day for the Sydney papers to arrive? I'd come unstrung in a week. Just waiting and waiting to read about a man called Keane being found with a knife in his back or his brains beaten out or six bullets in him. <laughs> Nobody's putting any bullets into me. Well, if they do, I want to be on hand. It's bad enough watching you walk out of here and waiting for you to get back in one piece. It'd be a hundred times worse if I didn't know what was going on all the time. You know, I did you a bad turn the night I leaned on your buzzer. I did myself a bad turn. Going overboard for a man who... Wait for it, Sherry. This should be Inspector Murray. Hello? Yes, it is, Keen. For you, of course. Mm. Hello, Murray. Yes, I was up half an hour ago. They are, eh? Right. You'll send a car, will you? Good man, I'll be down in the garage, waiting. Well, here we go again, Sherry. We've another whisper on the ring. What is it this time? Murray thinks they're trying to organise the taxi men. Two drivers were beaten up earlier this morning and a cab was set on fire in Somerset Hills. Neither of the three men concerned will talk. Murray wants a conference at Phillips Street. S.P. Bookies, dope running, now taxi cabs. What aren't this gang taking charge of? With cuts waiting for one of them to approach him at Gregerson Street, perhaps before long we'll know. Where's my hat? I'll get it for you. Don't be away longer than you have to, darling. If you knew what it does to me, trying to drown the suspense with clothes dry. 
So you gave two of them the treatment, Guzik. You burned one cab. Did you make a good job of it? Sure, we made a job of it. We bust open the fellow's petrol tank with a chisel, got well away, then Tony Rico throws in a match. For a while, we must expect some complaints, and the police will probably try to make an arrest. Now, these two you had to beat up. Let's have uh, the details, eh? We're starting on the taxi men last night. Me, Tony Rico, and Stephen. Stephen doesn't leave our car. The first guy, we're telling him he's paying every week one pound. Such a time, such a place. Well, he don't like it. He talks about going to the cops. Naturally. Um, did he get a good look at you? No. We jump in the back of the cab and tell him he doesn't look round. When he's talking about the cops, we talk a little more, scare him good. Then rough him up so he's understanding. Uh, how badly? Oh, we don't break anything, but it hurts. And each time it hurts, we're telling him this is just a little lesson. He's wanting it first. Just talk. All right. Now then, um, did you let the three of them know just what they're up against? Yeah. Just like you say, Mr. Huberman. I didn't go to the trouble of getting duplicates of traffic department files on the cab drivers for nothing. I wanted to use the file before you approach every driver. Look at the number of his cab, check it with your file. And let him realize, you know, where he lives, whether he owns his cab or not, and if he's got a wife and children, and so on. Work for the book is, the work of these chaps. Eighty three last night, they get the idea. See that you don't take them too lightly. Now, yesterday you ran into a chap there called Fenner, I believe. I'm telling Carlotta. Fenner's a man we can use. When I was at Phillips Street earlier this morning, Murray showed me a file from Scotland Yard. Fenner has a record a mile long. There's nothing on him right now. The meet is living in London by, um, roughing people up, as you say, Guzik. So he might as well earn it here the same way, for us. We give him a job. We don't. You do. The cabmen are your department, Guzik. Carlotta and I stay in the background. That's what you're getting a five percent for. Okay. We see some more cab drivers tonight. <laughs> it's your racket. Work it for all it's worth. Just keep our guiding principle in mind. Terror. When you tell them what'll happen if they talk, see that it does. Mm. Sell them protection. Hammer them so hard that your protection at a quid a week will be cheap at the price. And never forget that a man who's prepared to be put out of business, to have his cab smashed, to be beaten to a jelly himself, will think twice when you let him know that his wife and kids are included. In a couple of weeks, Mr. Huberman, we got them scared good. Just keep it tidy, Mike. Well, that's all. Get hold of Stephen and shove off for Gregerson Street. I want to talk to Carl Otter about our dope shipment on Sunday night. Mm, good day, mate. Want to see me? Yeah. You're Ben, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, what happens about the cops? They don't keep you in the pen? Does it look like it? I'm buying you a drink. What do you want? Beer. Okay, Jack. Three. You know me? I'm Mike Guzik. This guy is Stephen Meyer. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Yesterday I don't feel so good. Now it's different. Three pots of beer different. Yeah. These cops. What they're wanting you for. What would it be to you? Just trying to be gemutlik, mister. One time they're after me. Maybe again sometime. There's this line of business I'm in. What line of business you're in, mister? Anything that pays. Me and Stephen here, we're in a business that pays good. But the cops are interested in it, eh? If I knew about it, maybe. That's worrying you, mister? Not enough to give me no grey hairs. This little business Stephen and me don't run for our health. Sometimes she's not good for other people's health. What would it be uh, like, maybe? a kind of insurance business. Who would you be insuring? Against what? Taxi fellows against accidents happening a little. This insurance business Stephen and me are in, it's not like ordinary insurance. If there's no accidents, uh, who's wanting to pay? So to keep it good, fellows who don't pay, sometime we're supplying the accidency. Hmm. You've uh, 
got me real interested, mate. Stephen and me were thinking this fellow Fenner bought the job, maybe. Nice, quiet little job, keeping taxi men fixed up with nice little accidents. You know, cabs are catching a light easy. Drivers get a broken arm in a back alley. Things like that. Hmm. Sometimes you're just collecting insurance money. <laughs> you're wanting a job like that, Fenner? We're giving you 20 a week and we don't take nothing down for taxes. Eh, uh, who would a bloke really be working for, Matty? You'd be working for me and you're not asking any questions. Okay, Guzik. You've got yourself a boy. When I arrived in this country 12 days ago, they spun a web around me. Now the spinning has begun again, and slowly, strand by strand, the mesh is taking shape around the nightshade ring. When I was caught, the strands gave way. But when Felix Huberman and the Black Widow Carlotta are firmly enmeshed, the spider will be me, and the strands will hold them fast. Sergeant Cuts sees the nightshade ring in operation in the next chapter of this story of intrigue, Deadly Nightshade.